kind of a rehash of a story that I told a, a few months ago. Um, some of you might remember it, some of you might not. If you do remember it, then this will burn in some of the stuff I was trying to say. And um, this one right here was uh, this, this guy that I was, uh, you know, reading up on his stuff. He was saying he got this 99 Jeep Grand Cherokee. That says Grand Cherokee, but here's a, just a Cherokee on the lift, you know. I had to put a picture in there for him. Uh, it was towed in from out in the country garage. It would crank, but it wouldn't start. It was backfiring through the throttle body like the spark plug wires were crossed. You know, if you put your plug wires on, you remember when you were putting the 350 on, whoop, whoop, bap, boom, bam, you know? Back in the day when I worked at, uh, at uh, that shop in Enterprise you know, 40 years ago, and it was 41, 41. But anyway, I said, I'm going to put a plug wires on his Cadillac. So I, I said, I know how GM is wired up. You know, it's 184, So I popped all those spark plug wires on there, and I spun it over, and it goes, hoo, hoo, boom, fire out the carburetor, booming out the exhaust and all that. And I said, well, I must have crossed the ones that were going through the motor mail. So they run the wires through stupid ways back then. I'd swap. Maybe these two were crossed. And I'm boom, boom, bam, bam. And the uh, the guy that owned the shop was all jumpy. And he says, "What? Get that thing traced out." So I went to the shop manual, threw it on the bench, and found that Cadillac and opened it up. And it had a fire in order like I ain't never seen before. It wasn't nothing like a regular GM or a Buick or a Pontiac or nothing like that. So I had to figure out how to put. You know. Anyway, I got the plug wires on there right. It was good to go. Uh, anyway, leak mount test confirmed the head gasket was blown between two cylinders. Head gaskets blow that way, you know, they'll blow between two cylinders. What's that do to your compression? Adjacent cylinders will have different, I mean, will have low compression because the compression going back and forth, right? And that's how it looks whenever you got that. So it gets rebuilt, excessive warpage on the head, you know, you get your straight edge and go across the head after it's cleaned up and run your feeler gauge under it. If it's got too much warpage according to the service limits, you got to. Uh, you know, get the head trued up. And uh, he reinstalled and he had exactly the same problem. Well, he put a crank sensor on it, had an erratic signal on the scope, and went to change it, find out it was strapped in place, the whole down bolt been broken. In other words, somebody had actually stuck it down in there and just tie wrapped it. So when it was spinning over, it was probably moving around as the engine was jumping. That was making the signal be all crazy. So he had an extracted broken bolt and he had to reinstall a sensor, which is the sensor on this one is basically at the, uh, if you're sitting in the vehicle, it's at about the 10 o'clock position on the bell housing. Two bolts hold it in and they got a little, you know, a little curved bracket. It's got two bolts. It takes a 11 millimeter socket. Now you used to have to get up under there with a long extension and a wiggler to get them out. So you kind of learn how to do that. On the earlier Jeeps that had the 4-liter in it that uh, was built at the John Deere plant when they started putting those 4-liter cast iron straight sixes in them from uh, back in the 87, uh, those sensors basically were a variable reluctant sensor. And if we were measuring, if we had one it was hard to start cold, we would measure the voltage that that sensor was putting out. And if it wasn't putting out 480 millivolts when you were spinning it over, we'd know that it wasn't strong enough for that Bendix engine controller to pick it up. So what I found, I've got a long, heavy screwdriver, and I've got a notch and put in the end of it. And while I was watching that voltage and somebody was spinning it, I'd have a, you know, my meter hooked up to the sensor, just reading it. And, uh, and I'm talking AC current now, I'm reading AC current. And so I would bump that little bracket and bend that sensor a little closer to that uh, flywheel, and it would cause the voltage to go up in the range where it would work. See, that's a fairly simple fix. You know, you're not hurting anything, you know, the bracket's all you're bending. And I fixed a mess of them like that. Of course, if they wanted you just to put another sensor on there, and, you know, and that's sort of aggravating. But here's the other thing. On, the, on some of the Grand Cherokees, the sensor has a little paper spacer on the end of it when you get it, and it's an adjustable sensor. And what you're supposed to do is put that sensor on there and push it down so that little paper spacer is actually touching the wheel. And then the first time you, you know, you tighten it up, and the first time you crank it, it skins that paper spacer off and throws it somewhere, who cares where, and that's got your, your set right. I've got a box of those little paper spacers in there that's made by BWD, so you can stick a spacer on the sensor if you've had to pull it out and put it back on. Here's what happens if you don't use that. If you're just guessing at it, moving the sensor in and out until it seems about right, you know, you'll probably get it where it runs. But if you put it too close, it runs like crap. If you put it too far away, it may start, it may not, it may run terrible. So you got to get it just right. There's not any, you know, 
this thing, you know, but if you're doing it, trying to adjust it, you know, this side and that side, that's like shooting a gun in a submarine out in the water. You know, a few more of those, and they'll have their range. You know, you go on this side and that side. But anyway, the little spacer, uh, if you ever have to do one of those here, I'll try to remember to give you one of those. Anyway, you reinstall the sensor. Clean signal on the scope, same no start condition. Looked at the cam signal, really bad signal. Put a cam sensor on. The cam sensor is in this little synchronizer that would go where the distributor used to go. One of the problems these like to give, and it's unrelated to the cam sensor, but this little thing right here likes to start squealing and lock up. And when it does, it'll bust the gear on the bottom of it, stops turning, the engine quits running, and um, sometimes it destroys the camshaft. You know, and, and ultimately, and, and, but what you're supposed to do, and this is one of the good one over there, what you got to do is you're going to line up your uh, crank sensor on zero. Top dead center compression. Find top dead center compression. Put your finger in the hole. Puff. Bring it on up to top dead center compression. And then you're going to adjust this thing like you were turning the distributor until that. You got to drop it in there the right way to begin with. You got to adjust it so that that right there and this is a hole that's drilled through that and that. And I just used a piece of wire there. And you basically go through there and straighten it up. When you get it adjusted, you got your cam sensor set right. Pretty cool, right? Now, what will happen on these Jeeps if the cam sensor is not in there right is it'll start dropping pan companion cylinders. It may drop one and six, it may drop, you know, three and four, two and five, and, it, and it, it won't drop the same two companion cylinders every time, but the hotter it gets, the more it'll start to run crazy. And this can get out of adjustment as the timing chain stretches on one of those four liters. So be careful about that. Well, got a good clean crank and cam signals, and this is what they look like. If you're going to adjust that cam sensor with a scope, you're going to turn that cam sensor until this cam is switching halfway between two of these four towers. You got it? That's the one that's supposed to be right. I actually had one one time that was giving me these companion cylinder dropping things, and it was over here. And so whenever you turn it and get it in the middle, that's where it's supposed to be. That's an own good scope pattern there, by the way. Uh, that was an old PDA scope. I had a really good one. 99 Jeep Grand Cherokee, the full injector rail out, and while it was hooked up, we cranked it. Saw two injectors were not firing. The injector pulse was present on the two suspect injectors. They replaced the two bad injectors. So now they found two bad injectors. Seems like that ought to do something, doesn't it? You know, the deeper you dig, this is like I've gone and planted bugs for them, isn't it? You know, planted bugs and, you know, it's like sometimes I was talking to another automotive instructor one time. I said, sometimes I'll make one skip on the same cylinder for about three different reasons. So every time they find something and they fix it, it's still skipping. I need to do that with Tim so he would just throw his hands up like this one. Anyway, so here we go. Claim no start condition. Now we know the timing is not quite right, hence the popping up in the intake. So we pull the timing cover and find the chain was sloppy and had jumped two teeth. That's what the chain looked like. See, a sloppy timing chain. These old laminated chains were very quiet, but they were really bad to stretch and get loose. If they stretch a lot, the crank gets ahead of the cam, valve timing gets late, vacuum drops, and if it's got a cam sensor in there, it's not going to be giving you a uh, you know, good, strong signal. So, he was happy that this was the end of the nightmare. Yay, we finally found what was going on. And so he had had it dumped on him, you know, from another shop. But he was going to, he would see, you got to see, this guy was entangled with this thing, and he wasn't going to give up. Another thing you had to realize was he had time and money invested in this thing, and you can't really charge him until it's done and it's fixed, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to keep going. You don't give up. You know, throwing your hands up doesn't, you know, that's not an option. All right, new chain and gears, realign the cam sensor drive, still the same no start condition. Went over and over and over all the wiring between the sensors and the computer, everything was great. He's really being smacked around. You being smacked around? How'd that feel? All right, we were now thinking this has to be a computer malfunction. It has to be a computer, what else can it be? There was a used unit in the vehicle, put it on there, just like it was, just like it was. Nothing changes. How, where, what would you do at this point? Would you want to give up and quit? Maybe go roof houses or something? You know what I'm saying? All right. All right. Ready to give up and ship it off to somebody else. Last attempt. He Googled his problem to see if anybody else had the same issue. I'm going to tell you, we had this problem here. 
the exact same problem he had. Now, we didn't go as deep as he did. And I'll tell you something else. If you looked at all of the stuff he did, did he sell these people anything they didn't need? No. He didn't. Yeah, they needed a head gasket, right? He need, they needed that. The timing chain was sloppy and loose. They needed that too, you know? Of course, he's having trouble explaining why it still won't start, but at the same time, he's finding all kinds of stuff wrong. All right, so this guy pulling his hair out just like me. All right, what we did was we put an engine in a Jeep uh, Wrangler back here two or three years ago. Engine came from the salvage yard. They dropped it off back there. You know, and usually they'll bring you a complete engine with the, you know, the coil rail on it and all this kind of stuff. Now, you got to remember, this Jeep has got a coil rail on it. It's like coil packs, except it's a long rail, about that long. And it's basically has got, you know, the, the little boots on the clanger. So that they'll go right down to spark plug holes, and then you put bolts in there and bolt it down in there. Now, let me ask you this. You've got, if you're standing here looking at the engine, you've got a, a coil that you can see molded in there, and another coil, and another coil. Now, which two cylinders does that front coil fire, you think? Aren't these coils always going to fire companions? Yeah. On a straight six? Mm -hmm. One and six, two and five, three and four. Those are the companions. Because you're going to see the ones on the outside doing this together. Then you're going to see the next two doing this together, although they're like this with the others. You'll see three and four. Okay, so these two aren't firing coil one and two, are they? Yeah, they're firing probably one and six. See, it's got three coils. The middle one may be firing three and four, maybe, I don't know. And the one in the back may be firing maybe two and five. But you might just think just looking at it, it'll be firing these two, these two, and these two. Uh -uh. Ain't no way, man. It's got to be firing companions. So that means there's going to be these laminated strips going down the inside you know, routed on that. Now, on some of these Ford uh, ignition coils, like the one I call my ignition board, which is not in here right now, uh, if you see the, the, the uh, ones that have the wires coming in the side, and I probably got one over there somewhere, uh, you see the ones coming in the side, those have a different wiring than the ones coming in this way. In other words, the wires that are plugging in on the Ranger, they plug in this way, right? The, the wires on the coil. Well, they plug in that way on the coil pack on the 98 Ranger. Or right, on some of the cars, it looks like the same coil pack, but the wires are plugging in this way. However, if you say, well, I don't have one where the wires are plugging in this way, I'll just put one in while it's plugging in that way. You know why that's a bad idea? Because the innards of that coil are wired differently and the firing order is different. Now you can, if you know how to do it, pull the, extract the wires and put them in there in the right order, I mean, so to make it run right. But if you just plug the wires in, it's going to kick back, it's going to pop, it's going to snort, it's going to not start. And one day on the Mercury Sable out there, like if you took the Mercury Sable ignition coil and you put it on the Ranger, the Ranger wouldn't even start. And if you put the Ranger one on the Mercury Sable, it wouldn't even start. One time I took and crossed the plug wires on the Ranger, I mean on the Mercury Sable, and went here on this lift, and when I went to start it up, it kicked back, it busted the starter, and the starter was hanging from the wires. Said, That's brilliant. I was trying to make a bug for somebody, but as soon as it kicked back, there's so much force, it just snapped that cast aluminum starter housing and busted the starter, slam off of it. Dang. You know what I did? I went, whoa, oh, 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 what a what naivete. I didn't believe it was going to take that, but anyway. Well, maybe the wrong one. 99 and 2,000 mile a year have specific calls for each year, identical except for the plug angle and the internal wiring. They look just alike. Literally. You know, both you put them on there, and that's what happened back here with the, with this uh, Wrangler. We put the motor in. It was kicking back and snorting and popping and all that. And I went walking back there, and the student was scratching his head, and I says, "This is the motor you pulled out with it to call, yeah." And I said, this is the one you put in there. He said, yeah, that coil rail came with it. I said, take the coil rail off the one over there and put it over here just to see what happened. So when he did that, it went, fired right up. That's what was wrong with this one here. But see, this guy had stumbled through all kinds of stuff trying to pick it up. Anybody that's ever been in a situation like this, there's some people that will try to convince you that they've never had a problem they couldn't figure out in 10 minutes. No matter who's worked on it before, I can figure it out in 10 minutes. You know, this kind of stuff. I've had instructors like that in school. 
when I had one instructor one time that was telling us one that had beat him up, he told us about it. I worked on it for two weeks. I went fishing for a couple of days. I came back. I worked on it some more. <laughs> yeah, to take a vacation. <laughs> Everybody that was in that room, there was about 45 or 50 mechanics in that room, every one of them was stone dead quiet. You know why? Because everybody in that room had been right where he was. Beat up. That's right. He said, and, and, and he up. told me, you know, I mean, he told us, he, he stopped. He says, you know, when I came back, when I went home that last night, before the day I finally figured it out, he says, I was beat to crap, you know, except he used the other word. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the next day he went back and he found out there was some wires running under the intake that some rat had gnawed or something. I don't remember what it was, but when he found it, it was something you couldn't see without dismantling the engine. He checked everything looking for that. Well, it's all that ended the months of stress without the help of this forum. I don't believe he was on a forum I read about it. It was pretty cool. So uh, how can one vehicle have so many problems at the same time? Like I say, he didn't sell them they didn't need. It was a very interesting thing. Now there's a Mustang here, 99 Ford Mustang. All right, now you remember these front Mustangs right here, like this one, like this motor right here that I got right here. It's got a fuel rail pressure sensor. It's a returnless fuel system. And on the fuel rail, on that Buick that you guys put the fuel pump in, it's returnless fuel system. But General Motors tends to enjoy making the fuel pressure regulator be a part of the pump in the tank. So it's going to deliver 60 pounds of pressure to the fuel rail all the time. That's what that Buick does, right? Now, uh, the problem with fuel rail going into returnless, it doesn't have anything to do with the air. It just has to push it through the injectors and all that. And when I first looked at that thing and I had my fuel pressure gauge on it and I opened it up, I saw all that air coming out of the fuel rail. And I'd see it coming out, coming out, coming out, and, then it, and the engine seemed to run good. And I said, well, this fuel pump must be cavitating making air. And I've seen that before. I saw a, a Continental one time that had a V8 in it over at the... It was a 95 model, and it had a walking skip. I had LDS hooked up to it. Well, actually, it was WDSN, and it was walking through the firing order. One, three, seven, two, six, five, four, eight, and it would start over. And it stumped the hotline. I called them up, and they were like, you know, they did one of these. And I said, well, I was noticing that when I, when I put my regular fuel pressure gauge up to it, the needle was bouncing. And when I bled the air out of the fuel rail, it, the needle would stop bouncing and it would smooth out. And I said, that thing has got air coming up to this fuel rail. I saw a, a, a dead gum uh, Dodge van one time that was skipping on cylinder number one, which is the highest fuel rail on the engine. The pump was cavitating on that one and all the air was going to that highest cylinder. And it always had an air bubble right there, that injector, and it wasn't squirting nothing. It was skipping on number one because it had an air bubble. It was, you know, after I found that, after I solved the mystery, it was really pretty easy. This one here had poor fuel economy, middle lamp on, always happens. It's distributorless ignition, so on and so forth. Service engine, center lights on, pull the codes, got a PL172, bank one, rich. It's running rich. All right, looked at the scan data stream, found a pressure at 70 to 80 PSI. All right, checked with the gauge and found the same reading. Figured it was a fuel pressure regulator. Well, you know, actually this one here has got a module and it delivers more amperage to the pump when it's wanting the fuel pressure to be higher. That's what this fuel rail pressure sensor is all about that you see right here. And that's all got a vacuum line into it, right? So it basically can, the VCM is in control of the fuel pressure totally based on the feedback it's getting from the sensor right here. All right, so engine running fuel pressure, according to Ford's shop manual, is supposed to be 35 to 50. They're running 70 to 80. Think that's going to make it run rich? Too much pressure? Okay. Key on engine off fuel pressure, 25 to 40. 25 to 40, okay. Look at the scan data stream. This is what he had. All right, next he started looking for the return line, thinking maybe it was bent. Ain't no return line. It's returnless fuel system. Uses separately controlled fuel injectors. Fuel injectors are supplied with pressurized fuel from the pump through the fuel injection supply manifold. The manifold is controlled by the electronic fuel delivery module, which is enabled by the powertrain control module. All right, starts looking for the return line. Didn't find anything. Looked in Mitchell on demand. Seems to say this is a return system. Did that surprise you? <laughs> All right. Now I'm looking for help. Is this a return system or a returnless one? What besides the regulator would cause such high pressure? Mitchell says 35 to 55 if memory serves correct. All right. Got back on. 
Fuel pressure 70, coolant readings room temperature, key on engine off self test, gave him a P1237. Whoa, look at here. He followed the Mitchell Diagnostic 3, led him to measure the voltage between the power end of the fuel pump driver module and the fuel pump return line. Got battery voltage. Should be less than one volt. Saying I have a short the ground and the fuel pump return wire. So motor manual told him to unplug the fuel pump driver module and see if the fuel pump ran. It does not. Okay, so he's basically taking that out of there. Alright. Oh boy, I did that. I got something there going on. Anyway, this is what it looks like. Fuel pump driver module. There's your fuel pump. It's in total control of power and ground going to that pump, right? Engine controller tells that what to do. This has got a ground. Inertia shutoff switch basically tells this when to turn the pump off and all that. Okay, and so of course that right there is your fuel tank, you know, in this, this right here. So, so, um, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm not sure what that is unless it's a temperature sensor. It looks like a thermistor to me. I may be an idiot. Oh, instrument cluster. What the heck is that? I feel like a fuel gauge to me, doesn't it to you? Power train control line? Anyway, don't worry about that. He ended up diagnosing that with a logic probe. Unplugged the module, probed the fuel pump return wire with a logic probe. Should show nothing. He had ground. So he unplugged the connector under the car just before the gas tank. Still had ground. Had ground on both the power and return wire for the fuel pump. So he lowered the tank to try to access the wires and the ground disappeared and the fuel pressure returned. Because the tank wasn't touching the body of the car anymore. Dropped the tank, looked at the harness and didn't find anything. Put the tank back up and the ground came back because the tank was grounded to the car, right? So he pounded on the gas tank with his hand and made the ground come and go. Boom, 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 the ground would come and go inside the tank. Replace the fuel pump. The actual problem was that the fuel pump return wire inside the tank rubbed through the insulation that was grounded to the inside of the upper gas tank. And so it's basically the module, you see, wasn't able to control that ground because it was grounded all the time. You were made with that? Move the tank would move the wire enough to have a ground problem come and go. Okay, does anybody learn anything from this, or are you all bored out of your skull and want to go to lunch? Well, so. You want to go back to the last slide? I'll start reading that again. All right. All right. And I can show you the schematic here. See this? This is inside the tank, right? Yeah. All right, now, one of these is going to be power, and the other is going to be ground. All right. All right. The power was there all the time. They were going to be coming out of the module, apparently. And the ground is supposed to be pulse width modulated to control the pressure. Well, it was pinched to ground. It was making it. Making ground contact all the time. And, it had a, and the pump was running wide open all the time because the module couldn't control it. And that's why it was. And that's why it threw in the cone. And that's why it had the. That's uh, why it was running rich. That's why it had everything. And probably uh, high short long term. Mm -hmm. One time I was, one time I was working on a car that was a station wagon. It was an old Cavalier, and uh, they said when you'd come to a stop, it would stall. I said okay, so I went there and drove it. Sure enough, you come to a stop, it stalled. So I noticed when I put it in reverse and backed up in the parking lot, it was stalled in too. Hmm, that's interesting. So what I found out was somebody had put a fuel pump in it, and you know the sock that's on the bottom of the fuel pump. They had knocked it off when they was putting it in there, and they just went ahead and put it on in there anyway. And the little, uh, the round part of the pump that was where the sock was supposed to be was just a naked hole. And whenever you would stop, the gas would slosh and it would all can the gas tank up and it would stop up the pump. <laughs> See, when you backed up, it did the same thing. And so I was noticing, I put a fuel pressure gauge on it, I noticed when I stopped, the fuel pressure would fall far enough to install the engine. And when I backed up, it did the same thing. And that's when I realized that gas sloshing was causing that. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's just common sense, basically. Like on this one out here that we were working on, I ran it and ran it and ran it, and then when the spark went away and the engine died, it was, you know, still ginning up and all that stuff. I mean, in other words, if the engine is still turning but the spark stays gone, if I'm seeing the engine stall and the spark goes pop, 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 pop. I know it's popping right up until the last squeeze, but if the spark goes away and then the engine stalls and, and winds down, I know the spark is what killed it. And you can put a timing light on it and pull the trigger on a timing light and watch it flashing. And if the timing light quits flashing and it stalls, you know the same thing. You got me? Well, on this one here, we found a, on that stalling problem on that car, when I was getting ready to scope the cam and the crank sensor, whenever I, I mean, I noticed the bolt in that connector was loose 
we're talking finger loose and the connector was dancing around about the fall. <laughs> you couldn't see it. It looked just fine. But Kayla went and got a a, a seven millimeter socket and put that thing on there and I, I cranked on it for many a round before it ever got tight. And all that. I can't believe you didn't find that already. You know, so you get the <laughs> Anyway, we didn't lose that. It was at another shop before it came here, you know. Anyway, so of course you know us. We don't ever make any mistakes or do anything wrong. You know how that works.